someone we know, to hear about a very deep subject from a person who is full of it. On the power of poo, that's <laughs> Jim Anderson. <laughs> Appreciate that, Joel. So before I start my speech today, I'd like to apologize to you. The topic that I'm going to be talking about today is potentially an unpleasant topic, but I think it's important enough that I have information I want to share with you. So during the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you about poo. So let me ask you a question. Has anybody in my audience ever had diarrhea? <laughs> I would suspect everybody's had diarrhea at once. And you knew a lot about poo at that moment. You were thinking probably more about poo when you had diarrhea than you'd ever thought about poo before. Well, the interesting question is, why do you have diarrhea? Well, the interesting thing there is that something was going wrong on your insides, and obviously a very important part of your insides. So how does this all work? We're not medical doctors. We should have at least a basic understanding. So you eat food, and food goes into the stomach. Fantastic. Turns out the stomach doesn't really do all that much. The stomach is responsible for breaking food up, but then it shoves it into the small colon, which leads to the large colon, which leads to poop, right? As long as everything's working fine, we've got no problems, and I would suggest that perhaps you can get through an average day without thinking about poo. But if something should go wrong in this system, your life will be filled with nothing but thoughts of poo. So there's a condition called ulcerative colitis, and dear God in heaven, you do not want to get this. If you have this condition, you have stomach pain, you have intestinal cramps, and lots and lots of bloody diarrhea. Mm. It's a syndrome you don't want to have. They're not really sure how you get it. They think a pathogen gets into your system, goes down and affects your large colon, and you've got major problems. What happens in the colon is that you get ulcers. Ulcers are really bad to have. These are even worse because they're bleeding ulcers. So it kills about 30,000 people a year, and it costs a billion dollars in, in medical care to try and treat people like this. And there's a gentleman who came down with this condition. And he was a normal guy just like you, working in a normal job, and all of a sudden he had this condition. And his life changed dramatically. He, went, he did exactly what we would all do. He went to the doctor and said, I've got some serious problems. And the doctor gave him powerful steroids. And the powerful steroids made the condition go away. Fantastic, wonderful. That's why we go to doctors, right? Well, it turns out you can't stay. You don't want to stay on powerful steroids because they do bad things to your body. So once the conditions went away, he got off the steroids, and pow, it came back. So the doctor put him back on the steroids, but the second time around, the steroids was not holding the symptoms at bay. The pain worsened, and it got even worse, you're not gonna like this part, when he ate or drank something, which makes perfect sense, right? It causes the system to kick into, into action. And he could not sleep at night. So this was a huge problem. He suffered through this for a year. During that year, he lost weight. He could not sleep at night. He became smaller and smaller. He ended up having to take medical leave from his job. It was that debilitating. So clearly something that you don't want to happen to have anybody. The doctors told him he had actually two options. The first one was that they could put him on powerful immunosuppressants. Now these type of drugs are the drugs they give to people who have organ transplants so their bodies don't reject the organ. These things are powerful medicines. You do not want to have to take these because if you come down with something like lymphoma, your body won't have the ability to fight it because your entire suppression system has basically been turned off. The other thing they said that they could do is give them a total colonoscopy, which means remove the large colon. Remember, it's an important part of your body. The problem is if they did that, the tissue that remained had a very good chance of developing the very ulcers that he was trying to resolve. So, you know, what could possibly be worse? You have a medical condition, you go to the doctor, some of the two options they give you are almost worse than the condition that you have. This gentleman did a little bit of research and he discovered the most wonderful thing. Thank you, Google, right? <laughs> There's a procedure called a, fe a fecal Microbiotal transfer, FMT. Can you guess what that is? Can you? Can you? Oh, yes. <laughs> All right. 
Turns out that 60% of the matter in poo is bacteria, both alive and dead, although primarily alive. In the human body, bacteria outnumbers the cells in your body by 10 to 1. You are poo. <laughs> okay, they do a lot. Uh, the bio, the, uh, uh, the the little things in your body uh, are very important. They are very important as part of your digestive system. Uh, there's about a hundred strains that live in your gut. Did you know that? You're almost like a hotel for these guys. But they do incredibly valuable things. They do um, processing of vitamins. Uh, they do digestion, and also they keep bad bacteria in check. Okay. People have known about the power of poo for years. This is where it's going to get unpleasant. I'm sorry about this. During the Ming Dynasty, they had something called yellow soup. We're not going to go into that at this point in time. <laughs> in the US, fecal transfers have been used for years to solve problems with horses. In 1958, the first fecal transfer between people was done in the US. And since then, about 3,000 fecal transfers have been done globally. What does it take to do a fecal transfer? First off, you need a donor. And the donor is actually really important because that person has to have not eaten something that you're allergic to. Okay? They also have to be tested to make sure they don't have HIV or any sort of communicable diseases. Um, they also have to live nearby because once the poo is out of the body, the bacteria starts to change. So it's got to go from them to you as quickly as possible. What equipment do you need for an FMT? Good question. First off, and this is the important part, you need, listen to my words, a dedicated blender. Did you hear that? Let me say it again, a dedicated blender. You need a uh, sieve, uh, you need a, a enema tubing, syringe, and lots and lots of newspaper, okay? What you do is you take the stool, you blend it with saline, you strain it, and then you put it into your system using the piping. Sounds simple, right? There's no possible way that could have work. Turns out it does. And almost magically and almost instantly, it can cure your problem. You have to repeat it potentially up to two times a day, and then eventually just one time a day, but it can make the whole system go away. You completely replace the flora and fauna inside you. So if you find yourself in a condition where you have stomach pain, intestinal cramps, or lots and lots of bloody diarrhea, Think back to this speech and go find one of your friends who's got good poo. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you, Micro. I mean, Jim. <laughs> I have a simple solution for that. <laughs>